Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar where we're going to talk about plugins. If you're not already aware, and we'll just kind of start at the beginning here. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about the plugin ecosystem. Uh, so there's a lot of different plugins with Rundeck, and uh, we're certainly not going to even attempt to try to cover them all. Uh, we're actually going to start with probably the simplest and easiest and most common to use uh, plugins, which would be the node step plugin. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the workflow plugins, um, but really just kind of want to establish a basis for what the plugins uh, mean in the Rundeck world and what they can mean to you, the value therein. As an example, so uh, Rundeck is an application that adapts to your environment. Uh, we do our best to not require you to adapt to ours. And unlike a lot of software products where you have hard integrations, or you have to rely on the software vendor to create an integration to allow it to fit within your environment. Rundeck takes a little bit different approach. You can build your own integrations to your own products, which means if you have home-built applications or you have some unusual or some unique file formats or ways that you collect information, CMDB, those kind of things, um, we can adapt Rundeck and you can adapt Rundeck to fit within your environment and work within your environment. Um, when you install Rundeck, one of the very first things that you do as part of that installation process is making Rundeck aware of your infrastructure. And so the screen that you're looking at here, we call these resource models, uh, resource model plugins. So this is where we're going to collect that information from your environment about all of your infrastructure. So let's take a little bit deeper look at this and we'll begin to kind of delve into a little bit of this, of this ecosystem that we're talking about. So assume Rundeck is the black box here. We're not really a black box, we're open source platform, so uh, you can absolutely look at the code. But for the moment, let's just assume that this is Rundeck and Rundeck wants to be aware, let's click there, wants to be aware of your infrastructure. And that can be all kinds of infrastructure. So it can be your Linux, VMs, containers, Windows boxes, um, databases, network endpoints, right? Anything that you're gonna automate against, we wanna be aware of that infrastructure. So this is a key uh, about Rundeck. We're not trying to be a CMDB, but often because so many environments have multiple sources of truth about different parts of their infrastructure. Sometimes they split it between their private data center and the cloud. Um, we can pull all of that information in. And the way that we do that is we utilize those sources of information. So whether it's VMware or Docker or Azure, or maybe it's a spreadsheet, the most common uh, source of CMDB information, um, but a variety of sources. And we certainly can't exhaust all of those resources. We have to have a way to adapt to those sources of information because that's where we want to run the automation. That's the power of being able to run the automation across all of these environments simultaneously. So the way that we do that is we have resource model plugins. So this is our way of adapting that information so that Rundeck can intake that information and execute automation against that. We also have some additional plugins that allow us to add additional me metadata to uh, that information about those resources. But in simplest terms, this is how we ingest that information. So plugins are a way for Rundeck to adapt to your environment. The most important thing that you're going to do when you're using Rundeck is run that automation against those, against that infrastructure. So let's talk a little bit about how we do that. So. In the green here, we're talking about your automation. And your automation can be in all different forms, right? You can have scripts, uh, commands, and we can wrap a lot of those into what we call node step plugins. So there's a, one of the things about a node step plugin is we're going to run that against all of your nodes, all of the targets of this automation. Uh, we call them nodes. And so we're gonna orchestrate against each step is going to run across all of those. We also have what we call workflow steps. So if you think of a group of steps is contained into a workflow um, and you're going to run each step across all of those nodes. So if you're patching 500 servers, 
you're going to run those node steps across all 500 servers. But you might want to have a step within that workflow that does just one thing, not 500 things. And that might be updating a ticket or opening and closing a ticket or numerous other things that you would only do once in that workflow. Maybe it's sending the log file to a, a recipient or something like that. So we also have workflow step plugins. And surrounding all of these plugins, we have a workflow strategy. So what's the order? How are we going to actually run these steps? Are we going to run them sequentially? Can we run them in parallel across all of those environments? Um, do we want to have some logic about run these two steps first and then run the next three steps in parallel and then rejoin and, and continue to run sequentially? So this is called a workflow strategy. And this is what allows you to kind of organize how you're going to run these node steps. I tried to come up with an analogy for this. Um, the closest thing I could come with is if you had to, for every store that you enter, if you had a shopping list and you were going to acquire a bunch of items, um, but you had to visit several stores to acquire these items, well, so the node steps might be uh, kind of rel relative to, you know, here's the items I need to collect and maybe you have to collect them in a certain order or maybe it doesn't matter. Um, how you actually go to all of those stores would be the node orchestration. So again, another plugin that we use to allow you to uh, organize the way you're going to interact with those nodes. Maybe you're going to do it sequentially. Maybe you're going to do it at random. Um, maybe you have different ways that you want to engage those target endpoints. And the node orchestrator, orchestrator plugin allows you to do that. So again, we're adding flexibility, uh, both with the type of node steps, the things that you're going to do, the way we organize those things that you're going to do, and the way that they're actually executed against the targets of that. I skipped over the option model plugin because often with our uh, automation, we are trying to automate, uh, I'm sorry, we're trying to pass some options. We may have some drop down list. Uh, maybe we have a selection of databases that we want to hit against, but we only want to hit the ones in the West region that have these instances or whatever the options are. Uh, and we, so we also have an option model plugin that allows you the flexibility of creating your own options, even different types of options. Maybe you have to hit a, a URL endpoint to retrieve some JSON that has a list of valid properties. And based on that selection, you're going to go back to that URL and pull some more information and, and some kind of cascading options. So the option model plugin allows you the flexibility that if it's not already there, you can develop your, yourself, we can help you develop that. And then we can have your job, the things that you want to automate this workflow against those targets and we can we can adapt to that. So again, once you, the node orchestrator, now we actually execute against all of those different nodes. And the way we connect to those nodes may be different based on the type of node. So we need the flexibility, again, to whether we're SSHing, using WinRM or PowerShell, or whatever the means that we're using to connect with those nodes, we have to be able to adapt to different ways of connecting. And so that's where the node execution plugin comes in. So as we build this and kind of scaffold this information, you can begin to kind of see that for the major things that Rundeck does, all of the outputs and all of the inputs basically come in through plugins. And this is so we can adapt to just about anything in your environment. All of those different nodes may produce output in a different way, you know, the log output that comes, and that's important to us. We want to capture that log information. We will actually want to uh, file it against each one of those different endpoints so that we know for specific endpoints what was happening with that. So we collect all of that information, and again, we have an input that has a plugin that allows us to, uh, to see the log streams from those different endpoints. We have plugins that allow us to filter on the, the log information or highlight the log information. We can even convert the content of that information and even render it in a, in a pre-formatted way, maybe taking text to HTML or something like that. If you have a special need, uh, maybe you wanna convert some of that log output into variables that are gonna be passed on to an, another job, we can do that as well. So again, everything that you see there that has to do with the log ingesting and the log writing, 
to an external log source, we can adapt to that. And so as we get into this deeper, uh, and again, I'm not going to try to cover the whole ecosystem of everything. This appears really daunting because there's lots of boxes and lots of colors and uh, things like that. I think I scared uh, my team at Run Deck when I showed them uh, an early example of this. I think they were a little like, holy cow, what are you about to do with this? Well, again, the complexity is when you start to think of it in different terms of output input and all of the different types of inputs and outputs that you might have from Run Deck and where you want to send that information, it starts to make sense, whether it's a file system, whether it's your source control system, uh, key store systems, I've highlighted those in red. These are all about security. Uh, different endpoints that you can have for whether it's the SSO login or different ways of adapting to your, uh, your LDAP or Active Directory, as well as the key store that we use within Rundeck or that we can integrate with. Again, all of these are lightweight, loosely coupled plugins. These are not hard integrations. This allows that kind of flexibility and kind of that less opinionated way that we integrate with other applications. So let's, let's dig in a little deeper. We're gonna focus a little bit more on uh, some types of plugins. Um, let me give you some examples here. Uh, for example, uh, our notification plugins. This is when a job is running if you wanna send notifications. So if you have a unique application or maybe it's something that we, uh, there, there isn't already a plugin, this is easy to write, easy to create so that we can create these loose connections with these applications. So uh, this is just highlighting some of the examples of some existing plugins uh, that we use with notifications. Uh, I was mentioning uh, the log output. So here is some examples of the log uh, filtering plugins, different things you can do with your log information that's coming out because you know everybody has a different need or a different requirement for uh, how you're going to use Rundeck. Uh, so again, rendering it in a special, special format, maybe highlighting some output, maybe you're doing a log filter for anything that has fatal error and you wanna highlight that in yellow, because it might be important. Uh, so let's flexibility there. But this particular example, we're starting to get into a node step uh, plugin. So uh, Amazon S3 copy command, has a lot of different parameters that you can pass with that. Nobody uses them all. We use a subset probably very frequently uh, based on certain things that we're trying to do that can become repetitive. Uh, you could certainly script anything and put that into Rundeck or have Rundeck run on a, run a local script. Um, but to make this very easy, we can actually wrap this command and can just include just the parameters that we want into a node step plugin. And these are the ones we're gonna talk in detail about today, how easy this is. Um, you'll notice that we're, we've got some inputs here that are string, we've got some Boolean inputs. We'll talk a little bit about the different types that we can uh, cover here. But this is just an example that for something that you use repeatedly, or maybe it's a custom script that you wanna share with different teams and not, not labor them to have to look at your script to see what kind of inputs they can pass in or those kind of things. You can write that into a plugin, make it very, very easy for them to use that. So let's go into a little bit of basics. The plugins live in a single directory within Rundeck, um, and that's the libext directory. Um, you, you do not have to restart Rundeck when you deploy a plugin into this directory. Our plugins are either zip files or job, jar files and they are written in Java, Groovy, or your shell system scripts. Um, certain types of plugins require Java, certain types can use Java or Groovy, some plugins can use all three. Um, it just depends on the type of plugin and the way that we're uh, integrating with those plugins uh, within the Rundeck uh, machine itself, if you will. Um, and for full documentation on this, if you go to docs.rundeck.com, uh, you can find a lot of detailed information about the plugin development, all of the different parameters. There's just a, a, a copious amount of information in that, uh, in that URL. But the real thing you have to remember is docs.rundeck.com. So let's see here. Oh, yes, because it included my animation on that. So uh, I wanted to highlight some examples and because we're gonna get into the workflow plugin, I wanna go just a little bit deeper. 
on where this actually is within the Rundex screens. So the option model plugin, this is what allows you to add options to a job. Uh, you can see we've got these allowed values down here. So we can add to those allowed values. We can query uh, external services to pull in information for these. We can use static. Lots of, again, I keep repeating that there's lots of flexibility with this, but this is one of the, I guess this is one of the uh, unsung heroes about what makes Rundex such a, a unique tool and so, so powerful within your environment. The node step plugins, again, these are going to run once for each node in the workflow. So however many nodes you have identified or filtered on or based on tags or however you're doing it, um, this is going to run for every single one of those targets. And as you can see, there are lots, in fact, there's way too many to even try to put on one single screen, but the differentiation between the node step and the workflow step is pretty important. And when, and when you're creating a job, these are on their own separate tabs. You got the node step tab, you've got the workflow step tab. And as you can kind of see here, we've got like service now, we've got some single things that we're going to do uh, regardless of how many nodes, this is just a single action or activity that we are uh, a piece of automation that we're kicking off there. So the format, getting, getting even a little bit deeper, a little bit more technical, uh, the node step script plugin, and this is straight from the documentation, uh, but there is a format to this um, and we're gonna sh cover this again, but basically you have two directories and a YAML file, uh, almost like two turntables and a microphone, just a little bit different. Um, so we got a couple of directories for the contents, which this is where your scripts are going to go. Um, and that can be more than one script. Um, and then we also have a resources directory. Uh, the most common use for that is the icon that you want to use for your script. So we have a resource directory. Um, we have a contents directory that actually contains your existing script. You don't have to change your existing script. They keep it exactly the same as it is, as it is uh, particularly if it's, uh, anything that's interpreted like Python, Bash, Ruby, uh, et cetera. And then we have this plugin.yaml file that's going to define that. Um, and as we talk specifically about node step plugin type properties, these are, the, these are important because this is what you're going to pass into the script. Most common would be string. We use a lot of Booleans, but it could also be integers, all the, the selections that you see there for those type properties. Um, even select versus uh, free select. Um, select means you have to have one. Free, sex, free select means it could be one of a set of values, maybe multiple selections. Um, and then other options that you might wanna pass into that script. So just as you would expect with a, any programming language, we can, we can do different types of scripts there. Let's take an actual look at some of these. So as I go into Rundeck, uh, I'll just jump into a project here. I'm going to go to the jobs tab. And if you notice that things might look just a little bit different than maybe the current version, if you're running Rundeck OSS or you're running uh, Rundeck in your environment and you notice some of the changes here, uh, I am running on the latest snapshot 3.1. Uh, so there's lots of uh, user interface uh, goodies that, so this can kind of act as a secret preview. So thank you for joining. Um, Let's go to the jobs here. Let's say I'm gonna create a new job and we go to this workflow. So all these tabs up here, oh, the hotness, it's so cool. Uh, all the workflows right here. So we come down to where we're gonna add the steps. None of the options that you see up here, these are all plugins. So adding various types of options, we talked about that. Here's where we can add global lo uh, log filters. I can also add log filters to each individual step if I so choose. Again, more flexibility. It's like a yoga class. <laughs> so uh, here we get down here to the node steps uh, versus the workflow steps. And as I scroll down here, I'm going to stop on one that's fairly easy and straightforward. Um, and if we've ever done a demo, we sometimes cover this one, this little try util. So almost try until all of these down here are mostly just scripts. And you'll even notice that we kind of organize them. We've got Nixie because these are kind of Linux bash scripts, uh, but we do organize them into like file. You see, we've got a, a grouping for wait for. So these are like wait for the file to exist, wait for a directory to exist, make sure it wait, uh, wait for it to reach a certain size, all of these kind of things to make it easy because in your automation, usually you're doing a step and you're waiting for some output or something to happen there. 
a, a file to appear, then to continue on to the next step and those kind of things. Uh, this particular plugin, and, and it's not very big. We've only got these uh, really three inputs right here. Let's jump to, let's see here. This is gonna jump to an actual, had that all ready to go. So let's cover this one more time. This is inside the zip file, or I've, I've uh, unzipped the zip file. And the environment that's inside of that zip file, we have a contents directory, we have a resources directory. Here's the, in, here's the contents of those. So here's my single script. And this is gonna be a pretty easy example. I'm gonna show you a multi example of this here in a moment as well. The resources, so this is the icon that you see right here on the screen. So now we're gonna take a look at the actual plugin.yaml that defines this. Uh, you can use any of the existing uh, plugins that come with Rundeck and, and use that template, or you can use the template that's in the documentation, uh, cut and paste that, and then you know, replace all of the stuff in it with your specific material. Uh, as we get in here, so we've got the name of the uh, provider, the type of service, so this is the type of uh, uh, plugin step that we're doing. It's we've got the name or the title of it. We've got the plugin type, which is a script. We've got our script interpreter, which is Bash. So if it's Python, same thing. You're just going to call the interpreter that is on that machine. Uh, we've got the name of the script file. So this is what's in that contents directory. Has to be an exact match there. And then the real magic is the script arguments. So here we're gonna pass three strings, just like you see here. The first one is the max attempts. So that is right there. We've got the interval. We're gonna wait certain seconds between uh, trying again. And then we've got the actual command that we're going to run. Now to give you a little background as to why we wrote this, uh, we had a customer that had a database that they had some long running jobs, took eight hours or so to run uh, four or five steps against this database to pull data, create files, run some automation against those files. And this long running process at some, sometimes that database would just stop responding. Uh, you know, it was an issue within the database or within the infrastructure. They were having issues trying to even diagnose why it would fail, but sometimes it would fail. And to restart that eight hour job was very painful, very expensive for them. So they wanted a way to make sure that each step completed. And if a particular step didn't complete, they wanted to retry that individual step. And so to do that, what we did is we basically were calling from the command line, the run deck command line tool to run a job. And if at the command line level, that job returned with anything but an exit zero, we would uh, rerun that job. Here's the actual script that we're running. So this is exactly you know, what I was telling you, the, where we've got the max uh, attempts that we're passing in, we've got the wait interval that we're passing in, and we've got the command that we're running. So we're evaluating that command. Um, and again, if it's not an exit zero, it keeps trying at the, at the uh, uh, command line level. So if that server flaked out or disappeared and then came back online, this could uh, get across and get past that little issue and, and keep right on going. So here's a question from Nate Button, and he's asking, can you show the Python script behind the S3 plugin? Oh, of course. Challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. Yes, yeah, so as I continue to, so this YAML file, just a little bit bigger. When we get to the bottom of this YAML file, there's the end. Here is the Python script for the S3 copy command. So we're doing some imports, we're doing some parsing. We've got some if these things are true. So again, these are all the parameters that you were passing in um, into that S3 plugin. Basically, if those things are true, append to the command that we're gonna pass on to S3, that's the, how you can append those different parameters. So this is how you can control when a, a single command has a ton of parameters, how you can isolate just the ones that you're interested in and give your users the ability to turn those on and off, uh, particularly if they're writing jobs. And that's the end of that particular. So not a real large Python script there, um, but if you are, have a lot of scripts, particularly environments where you have different types of scripts, different organizations within your IT department, 
maybe the you know development always has some scripts sometimes qa has some scripts um, definitely your dbas have lots of scripts you can wrap all of those into plugins and then make it very easy we even have some customers that do run deck as code where they will take uh, build scripts in development they will check those in version them and pass those into the QA and those will get passed on to your operations group. And then they can also give you back that self-service capability so that you can run the stuff that you actually wrote for operations, but they're giving you permission to run it maybe in production. Uh, that's a huge piece of what Rundeck does. And that is really our focus is uh, expanding into that self-service. So these plugins make it easier for you to write scripts and then be able to turn that around and, and offer them as self-service. So hopefully that was, uh, that was worth seeing right there. Uh, we had, there was one more group that I was going to take a look at and this was down here. So again, we were taking a look at the command try until I was going to take another look. It's a really the same thing, rehashing what we've kind of already covered, but allowing it to sink in just a little bit. Uh, all of these files. So if the file contains a pattern, if a file exists, doesn't exist, rotating files, rotating keys. There's lots of different things that you probably do uh, in an automated fashion in components, but when you put them together into a workflow, you can start to really do some cool things. So we wanted to take a look at the file exists. Pretty weak, uh, really the, the <laughs> that's a weak example, sorry. But what I wanted to really show was that again, we're doing multiple things within the same YAML file. The contents directory here, we've got these scripts. So there's the exists right there, my icon. Uh, here is the, so the YAML file is going to be just a little bit bigger because we're including, I think, six or seven different scripts here. Um, here's the Nixie file contains definition. As I go down, I can see here we've got the name for Nixie file exists. We assert that a file exists and if it does not exit one, it's another bash script. It's a plugin type of script. And then we're just passing in a couple of arguments there. The step label that you see there doesn't have to be in the YAML file or shouldn't be in the YAML file. That's, um, that is a default for every step that you have so that you can label those steps. And if you're watching the progress, then you actually know what step you're watching. And so that's why we allow you to do that label thing there. So there's the file path. We're just doing a simple command if it exists or not. And that's the bash script that we're wrapping around. So it, in fact, it's probably sometimes an advantage. It's a lot of times we will have users with really long automation scripts with lots of different steps. And we will typically try to break those, you know, obviously they're kind of sequential um, usually, but we'll try to break those up into smaller components so that we can kind of, you know, instead of giant Lego walls, we want to break those up into the little Legos so that you can rearrange and reuse and use with other automation workflows that, that you might be building. Hey, Tracy, we've got a, another question that came in on the Q and A. And it's a great question. Uh, the challenging part about it is me reading it. Um, he's got a very specific example um, of, a, of a step plugin that's allowing for a selection of a key from the key store to, uh, to populate their password input. But the complaint is that the script isn't really getting the password in. So I don't know if you're able to swivel your head and see the QA window in order to read that. And if you can't, we could probably take that um, take that question down and answer it offline in email. Uh, it's totally up to you, Mr. Walker. Well, Mr. Philman, um, a couple of different options. I I don't know that I can troubleshoot this as I'm looking at it, um, but brings up a great point. So, one of the things that also makes Run Deck different is our support team. Uh, it might be an ACL thing. Absolutely. Um, but here's, here's kind of the thing. So a couple of different ways we can go. We have a Google group that we provide a lot of support. We have dedicated resources to helping the, the community in the Google group. Um, so that's a great place to start. Uh, scan for things like this. Um, if you have Rundeck Enterprise and you're a licensed customer of Rundeck, support includes exactly these kind of things, especially if you're trying to build a plugin 
for a, for some automation that you have. And if you're struggling with that, we are there to help you. So fix or bugs that we provide uh, support on. Uh, we actually provide a lot of uh, kind of helping out with these kind of things. In summary, we did cover a lot there. Um, if you have any questions, uh, comments, can we do this? Can we do that? Feel free to email me. I'm Tracy at rundeck.com. Pretty simple. Uh, also feel free to email support at rundeck.com if you're a paying customer. Um, we really try to help everybody that we can help. Uh, there is the Google group. I didn't put that link up here. Uh, forgive me for that. Uh, but if you want to at me on Twitter um, or DM me. Uh, and so that's our webinar today. That's how easy it is to build plugins for your existing automation scripts. Tracy, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, question coming in from Niall asking if the dash plugin suffix is always required per the documentation. Uh, he's seen some, a few script plugins like Nixie, IRC, if you recall correctly, that don't necessarily adhere to that. I think the question is about consistency in format. Yes. Um, let's do some live searching real quick. Um, as we get down here to the section within the uh, Rundeck documentation, um, let's see. The plugin type, I think, is required. Uh, I'll have to check on that. Um, dash plugin suffix really required. I'm assuming that the plugin type is required because I know that the script interpreter would be required to interpret the type that you have. Um, so I'm not, I don't know. That's a great question. But I will tell you this, if we find that it is not in our documentation and it is or isn't required, if you will pass on your address to uh, me or anybody at Rundeck, um, we like to reward those who help us improve our documentation. And I just got an email, yeah, so Greg Schuler, um, the answer is no, it just needs a dot .zip. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes, hi uh, Hello, um, so yeah, if you scroll up a little bit, um, you can see right there where it says script plugin zip structure, and then yes that you need this uh, directory of dash plugin. And then uh, you can see in the example, and then you see the file name of the plugin zip must end with dash plugin dot zip. And it appears to be, that doesn't appear to be the case uh, in practice. It looks like Rundeck is a little more forgiving of that. So I just wanted to confirm that. Uh, it is, in fact, let's do this. Um, All right, so, and I'm gonna CD into my lib ext directory. So here is the names of all of the plugins that I have in my container in my lib ext directory. Um, and you can see that these have, you know, file copier zip, source.zip, so yeah, not required. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has a, hand, has a hand up or not, but perhaps while I'm stealing you, could I trouble you maybe for some practices about version control for plugins? Um, can you, you know, as long as you say, if you're incrementing the, uh, the version, does that overwrite the old version that's already in there? Or is it better practice to remove the old plugin entirely and then just reinstall the new one? I believe it's better practice to remove the old version because I think that Rundeck would see them as two... Uh, you know, for every zip file that's in that directory, that's an additional plugin. And it doesn't supersede. Uh, I'm sorry. It doesn't su it, the new version doesn't supersede it. I believe that the new version is going to be seen as an additional plugin. Um, Greg just corrected me. So Rundeck will attempt to pick the latest version if multiple versions are installed. Okay. So there you go. Thank, Thank you, Greg. You. Appreciate it. And they also responded, the only requirement is that the first directory in the zip has the same name as the zip file. Which is trivial. Thanks. What kind of, how many uh, plugins have you written, Niall? Uh, 
six or seven, I suppose, for our use. And uh, I've got coworkers who've done it a lot as well. So we're really all in on the, uh, on the plugin architecture here. Fantastic. Uh, what's a cool use case that you guys have written a plugin for? Oh, uh, um, we have a, a number of API calls. We have uh, some stuff that goes to Xenos. We have stuff that goes to, um, uh, to Remedy. Uh, we have you know, a number of uh, service buses that you know, we use Python backend scripts that are bundled into a plugin uh, to perform tasks. So uh, anything that we want to uh, offer to the enterprise, uh, to, excuse me, to the enterprise uh, with minimal effort in maintaining, uh, we try to turn it into a plugin. That's awesome. And no Java developers among us. I'm sorry, what'd you say? There are no there are no Java developers among us though. So it's all script plugins, nothing no no like you know, Grails or Gradle or that type stuff. I see. Are you using Remedy for your uh, ticketing system? Uh or ITSM? Yeah. Uh, I I I'm not sure I should answer that actually in chat. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> That's fine. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to didn't mean to get into it, but that's awesome. I uh, love hearing, we love hearing about the use cases. We are constantly amazed and surprised at how different users of Rundeck have adapted it to their environment. And, and you know, especially the ones if, if, like yourself that have been writing some plugins and kind of adapt it to your environment. Um, we've had some really cool use cases for uh, how they've, allowed Rundeck to, you know, orchestrate a lot of different automation and extend those uh, workflows into self-service. Are you guys doing any self-service? Uh, a little. We're rolling it out. Um, it's, it's still maturing in a way, so a lot of the work is still on, our, is on my team. Um, it, we also have some really extensive LTM and GTM or big IP DNS automation that we use as well. That's uh, been pretty massive here. Oh, that's know, fantastic. plugin has been great. Fantastic. Well, thanks for joining me today. Appreciate it. I appreciate this. Thanks.